sometimes I've been afraid to ask you on because I know I'm crazy. I say some crazy words and things like that. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe Coach doesn't want to always be associated with some of the things I say on the podcast. <laughs> I know we have lots of good football conversations. Oh, yeah, baby. There's a reason we just used that opening right there. It's Chris Sims unbuttoned, and it's the Wednesday What the Heck Happened podcast. I'm saying what the heck happened because I have a certain guest today where I feel like I need to watch my mouth a little bit when he's around. I don't know. I know he doesn't even care, but I can't help it because I respect and like the guy so much that I don't want to be too disrespectful to him at all. But we're going to hit on a lot of stuff today, and I have the great. Tony Dungy. If anybody's watching on YouTube sees us right now, he is going to join me for the podcast today. And we're going to break down a lot of things that are going on around football. Uh, Coach, uh, thank you for lowering your standards once again here and coming to hang out with me for a little bit and talk some football. I really do appreciate it. I'm excited to be on the show and looking forward to getting unbuttoned. Okay, good. See, look at you. Look at you all professional and stuff. And see, you you are. I like you got you got unbuttoned. Yep, I, I'm unbuttoned. not gonna. You're unbuttoned there. You're good. You're good. And I, I like it. I don't know if I've ever seen that background there behind you in any of your your TV stuff before. So that's yeah. A, usually I'm flipped the other way, and you see the NBC background. But this is all the Colts and Bucks memorabilia and. Uh, very, very nice uh, spot. I feel comfortable here. Oh, uh, yeah, you should. You should. Okay, well, well, about your memorabilia is the first question I want to ask for the day right here. You know, that room, you had uh, more Colt stuff, more Buck stuff. How does it break down percentage-wise in that room there? It, it's 50-50, but I'm just sitting in front of the, the Colt stuff oh, right sure now. Oh, sure you are, sure. Good, oh, there's a lot of good Buck stuff in here. You're allowed. You're allowed to go sixty forty Colts. You were allowed to do that. No. You did win the Super Bowl with them, and we would have understood. <laughs> Next time we're on, I'll shift over and I'll be in front of the Bucks stuff. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds good. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I think we know you're sitting in front of the Colts stuff because you knew where we were going to start this conversation. We got to address <laughs> the the elephant in the room. I mean, Jeff Saturday kicking butt on a Sunday last week. Um, first off, I guess just would like to get your initial reaction last week. You know, I, I don't know if you had an inkling that this was going to happen beforehand at all or anything like that, but you know, just when you first heard the news of Jeff Saturday taking over, what'd you think? I was just as shocked as everybody, Chris. I had talked to Frank Reich a couple of days before that, uh, talked to him about the change he was going to make with his offensive coordinator. And we talked through that. He's looking three, four, five weeks down the road. And I was shocked when I heard he was uh, released. And then I had talked to Jeff Saturday, believe it or not, we're trying to coordinate a speaking engagement. I was going to come down and speak uh, at an event that he was hosting in Atlanta. We're talking about that, talking about the season, no talk about the Colts or anything. And I hear that news. It was just unbelievable. But, you know, Jim Irsay, I I have to say this, when he gets something in his mind, that's the way he goes. And the same thing happened with me when I got fired by the Col- uh, by the Bucks. He called me and said, hey, you're the guy I want, and I'm hiring you. Don't even call your agent. Just write down a number and tell me what you want. Send it to me, and you got it. I mean, th- that was our negotiation. He had made it his mind, and he told me later on. He said he was a fan of the Steelers, the way they did it. He was a fan of what I did down here. That's the way he wanted to put his team together, and nobody was going to change his mind. So he had an opinion of what the team needed. He felt like Jeff could bring that. And when you really think about it, it was kind of logical. Okay, I I don't have many choices. I need somebody who can energize the building. I need somebody who's a leader, and I need somebody to help our offensive line, which is the most underperforming unit on our team right now. And so Jeff made sense, even though he didn't have a lot of experience. Yeah, you know, in in a lot of ways, I mean, it's easy to sit here now for a guy like me to think about it and go, yeah, you know, th- there is some things that make sense about it, and maybe you know, the way they played on Sunday certainly helps out, or at least helps me in that thought. But uh, other thing, I just want to ask you, like, did you ever know that you know Jim Mersey had that kind of affection for Jeff Saturday to maybe even be on the radar for this type of conversation, or even vice versa, that Jeff Saturday was ambitious to want to be a head coach of the Colts one day? Yeah, I knew they had a great relationship. No, I didn't know Jeff would even think about coaching. And, you know, we talked about high school coaching and how much 
effort that took now his, his kids are a little older now and and they're out and out of the house so that makes a difference too but yeah jim had that kind of affection but you don't always know that uh, i got hired as an assistant coach at 25 years old i had never coached in my life i didn't know coach noel felt that way about me he he brought me back to coach guys who were older than me who taught me defense and it, it didn't make any sense at the time but he saw something in me, and maybe Jim Mercer sees the same thing in Jeff. But I think what we have to understand, this might be a long-term decision, but this was really about a, an eight-week decision. What can we do to win these games right now? What's the best move we have? And he thought it was Jeff Saturday. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's it's amazing. Like, uh, echo the – or just some of the sentiment of Jeff Saturday, the player, and just what he was like then and how cerebral he was and – you know, did, could you understand him being able to pull off this type of job? I mean, him and Peyton Manning must have been some little combination you had there yeah. on the offensive side of the ball. I absolutely could see it, Chris. This is a guy who was a free agent, undersized guy who nobody thought was going to make it. He works himself into a Pro Bowl center. He is the glue of the offensive line. He and Peyton Manning and Tom Moore uh, and Howard Mudd, they're having meetings. How are we going to do this? When we recognize this, how are we going to block this? He's kind of orchestrating everybody up, up front and involved in the, in the, in the process of, of what we're going to do. He's a leader. He's coming into my office and telling me what's going on with the team. Hey, we might need to think about this, Coach. We are really overworked. You might want to think about right. uh, cutting back. Uh, that's one conversation I had with him after our Super Bowl year. Hey, our off-season program, we might want to look at this. We've played about 15 extra games now in the last five years. We've practiced for sometimes six weeks after the regular season is over. Maybe we don't want to think about cutting back. And he had a great point. So I ended up changing the, the program for the veteran players wow. in the off-season because of him coming in and making a suggestion. And he wasn't afraid to come into my office. You know how coaches say, my door is always open. Well, there's only one or two guys who are coming in there. And Peyton Manning was one. Jeff Saturday was the other one. Guys would come in to his locker and say, hey, can you talk to coach about this, this, and this? And he would be the guy to come in and do it. Wow, yeah. So uh, th that shows. It shows. And, and you know, it's a, it, he sees the big picture. And that's where I kind of want to go with you next because, you know, I, I watched the offensive side of the ball, the film of that game, you know, uh, yesterday a little bit. And – you know, some of the things you're saying, I think, kind of jump out to me. And I'm going to lay some of them out there, and you tell me if you agree, disagree, you know, either way. But, man, first off, I, that was the best game the offensive line played all year. It's hard not to think Jeff Saturday didn't have a, have a say in that, right? I mean, they ran the ball as good as they've run. They protected Matt Ryan as good as they protected the quarterback all year. And I thought that was something that jumped out, too, Coach, and, and too – you know, with that, and I want you to jump off of this here in a second, it's almost like he simplified things, too. It's like they, they only ran three run plays in the run game. It was three run plays, and it was just like, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to overthink it. Do it right. Do it physical and fast and hard, and we'll have some success. And that that has to be the effect of Jeff, Jeff Saturday. Am I wrong in that? You're right, and I'm laughing because Jeff Saturday for seven years heard his head coach say, when things aren't going well, do what you do best and do less. <laughs> and so he comes in and says, all right, we're going to give Jonathan Taylor the ball. No question about it. We're going to cut back. We're going to run three or four plays. We're going to run them well in the running game. And we're going to throw a little more quick rhythm. We're going to get people open quick. and get Definitely. Our quarterback has been sacked more than any quarterback in the NFL. That's not going to happen on Sunday. So they rush for 170-something yards. They get sacked one time, and they score points. And they did it by doing what they do best and doing less. Yeah, no question. It was the number one thing that jumped out to me. And like you said, too, there was only two, three plays the whole game where Matt Ryan was asked to, like, hey, hold the ball and let's maybe wait for the 10 or 15-yard yeah. completion. For the most part yeah. of the day, it was that quick passing game, some RPOs that I thought I hadn't even seen in their attack yeah. before that were a part of it. So, you know, again, it, it's 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 one of those where you go, wow, that was a weird decision for a guy like me. I knew he could lead some people and, and you know, maybe rally the troops emotionally, but it's hard not to look at it and think he didn't have effect on, on the football game overall. And, 
you know, what, what's your thoughts of the Colts going forward here, Coach? We know the defense well, I, is like real. It's real. You know, do you think they can be? I, I said yeah, I would not have made the change uh, from Frank Reich because they're three, five, right. and one. I think they're right in the heart of things. You win a couple of games in a row, you're right back in the playoff hunt, and this is a great year to be in the playoffs. Uh, because I don't think there's a super team out there. Right. Because they had already beaten the Chiefs. Now we're we're going to say the Chiefs might be the best team in the AFC, and they beat them already. Yeah. So uh, I think the Colts can be right there. Keep running, Jonathan Taylor. Keep doing what you're doing. Rely on the defense. It's not a uh, tough formula. Washington showed us that formula the right. other night. That's let's right. run the ball. Let's keep the pressure off our defense. Let's just hustle and play aggressive. And we're playing against an undefeated team. Let's see what happens. And I think that's where Jeff went in and said, you know what, this is who we're going to be. And as, as I might be here for two weeks or eight weeks, or, uh, but this is who we're going to be. We're going to play aggressive. We're going to play tough. We're going to run the ball the offensive line. You got to come. You got to earn your money. And they did. They did. They did. There was a different attitude uh, with the offensive line. It just, it was the way they fired off the ball. And I think the simplification that you talked about yeah. gave them the confidence, no doubt. I'm with you, coach. They're D. You know, it, it's it's every bit the fourth-ranked defense in football. It's not a mirage. I also, of, yeah, go ahead. I also think Jeff went to Matt Ryan and said, hey, I'm a center. I'm not a quarterback, but you can't hold the ball. When, so you look at your first read. If the guy's open and it's a four-yard game, throw it to him. Right. And he was doing that, and they got some short ends that turned into touchdowns when guys running after the catch, but he got it to – to those receivers and said, hey, we're going to take five yards instead of minus eight, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's right. And, and really, you talked about the one sack. That was the only bad play Matt Ryan really had the whole day of holding the ball a little too long. And when the guy was wide open what, in the flat for hey, the first down. <laughs> first down, and damn, you're in field goal territory, and then they missed the field goal. And I was like, oh, man, that's the Colts. Even Jeff Saturday can't fix that. But he fixed it. And, hey, Coach, I don't know. You just brought up Washington and the Eagles, and I kind of want to go there next but because I want to talk about the Eagles. But I, I don't know. I'm one of those after seeing last week going – I don't think it's crazy to think the Colts can keep this close with the Philadelphia Eagles with that defense, and if they can run the ball, and we saw somebody can run on on Philadelphia, uh, I I don't think it's crazy to have that thought, unless you know, unless you say I'm crazy, no. then I'll believe you. No, what was the Washington formula? Okay, we're going to run the ball, we're going to make first downs, we're going to convert third down and three. We might even uh, miraculously run it on third down and three. Who who knows? But we're going to keep the ball. We're going to not give up big plays. We're going to make Jalen Hurts make several throws, and we'll see what happens. And that's a formula that the Colts can follow. It, they can yeah. definitely run the football. They can pound it in there. They can make the occasional big play. When they get one-on-one, -on -one, they, they, uh, they have some receivers who can win. And defensively, I think they're going to rally and use their speed and, and – Make you know Philly's not going to score on big chunk forty yard right, plays. Right, right. That that's what you can count on from the Colts. All right, so let's let's hit on Philly a little bit, Coach, if you don't mind. Just the, that conversation. I almost want to do a thing here. It's we were we we kind of labeled it as contenders, capes and kryptonite, right? Like the the one thing they're great at, and then what's our one concern about the football team, or we think it's an issue for them. Now, Philadelphia. Well, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Philadelphia. What, I do think they put a lot of pressure on you defensively with all the things that they can do. And you right. got to do so much to stop that run game and Jalen Hurts. And then one on ones, can you handle A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith? But their kryptonite can be if they don't get ahead. And we've seen it with a lot of teams. We've seen it with the Cowboys. Okay. We've seen it with the Buffalo Bills. If you can stay in the game and run the ball at them and wear them down where you don't feel like you've got to score 40 points. Uh, then those defenses aren't the same. They are great when you have to throw and you become one-dimensional because you're behind. Right. Yeah, I, Coach, I, I hear you there. I, I, I think specifically I look at it, and I, you know, it, it's kind of weird to say this. It, it, to me, they're kryptonite because I'm with you on the offensive side of the ball, the part that's great. I mean, it's they got a lot of answers for everything, weapons, physicality. Hurts is playing awesome, throwing the ball well, making great runs, doesn't turn it over. But I, I, the defensive line, and I think more more than anything to me, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm almost a little concerned about the pass rush as well. 
uh, it, it, you know, th- that that was what jumped out to me. I know you, you were right. Washington ran the ball on them, but I was just shocked at how many third down situations where, you know, it's a Washington offensive line that we don't look at that is real great. And yet Taylor Heineke had plenty of time to go through reads and let some plays develop down the field, which, you know, again, I think Philadelphia will get away with it against a lot of teams, but we're holding them to a Super Bowl caliber conversation here that would that would scare me against some of the better teams in football. Yeah, it, it, styles make all the difference in the world. And Philadelphia is playing ahead. They're playing with energy and momentum. And, boy, everything looks great. And uh, I'll tell you this. It is so much easier to rush the passer when you're ahead and you know that other team has to throw. Well, now when you you had to defend five runs and now you get to that crucial third and four, you don't have as much zip to rush the passer when you just had to take double teams and do all that. Take people on five or six plays in a row. We see the same thing with the Cowboys. this, This defense is, you know, top 10 all time. And then all of a sudden, a, a couple of teams run the ball at them, and it, it's different. Yeah. Buffalo Bills leading the league in scoring defense. Now we had some games where teams just pounded it a little bit. And that, that's a different animal. Yeah, it is. It, it, it definitely is. And it's getting to the time of the year where – I think what you're trying to say is pounding the rock a little bit and running the ball can certainly have an effect on some of these really good teams. Um, yeah. All right, let's go to the next team. One of the uh, one of your exes, one of your ex, co- you know, coaching ventures. Not head coach, but assistant. The Minnesota Vikings. You just brought up the Buffalo Bill game. Uh, I mean, again, coach, I'm one of those that sits here and goes, "Man, they're eight and one. I'm not really sure how they've done it. I don't know if they've really played a full dominant four quarter game yet." or played in a really elite level for an extended period of time, but they hang around and make the plays when they got to. And there's a lot to be said about that. But, you know, how, how real do you view the Vikings? And, and, and what is the one concern you, you have with them as, as we go forward here at the last part of the season? I, I love where they are. I think they've got a tremendous attitude. And to me, that is the big difference. Mm. The, what you saw on the plane the last couple of weeks, Tell me if that would have happened with Mike Zimmer there. No, it wouldn't. You, Coach, uh, you know, that, that, I got to give wouldn't. you credit. You said this in the summer. I'm just going to let everybody know. You were on the Vikings in the summer about the new attitude in the building and how you thought that could be something that helps yeah. them out. I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, you're no, right. You're, you're, you're absolutely Never right. Never would have Kevin saw O'Connell that in the old day with has, Kirk Cousins. brought that. Hey, <laughs> yeah. we're going to have some fun. We're right. going to enjoy this. But he's also brought a, an attitude, okay, we are going to be a complete team. Yeah, we've got Justin Jefferson. We just traded for TJ Hawkinson. We can throw the football. We've got Adam Thielen. We've got that. But you know what? When we get in these third quarter, fourth quarter, we're going to be able to run the ball. We're not going to forget about Dalvin Cook. He is going to be part of this. And they, they're they kind of uh, like, like a lot of people. They have this offense. They can put pressure on you, and they've got pass rushers. Now, the question is going to come, okay, when we get in that slugfest and it's not, you know, 45 passes against that defense, when they've got to stand in there and defend the run, will they be able to do it? But I, I like where they are, and I like the attitude of this team. I, I, I'm with you there. I, I do love the attitude, the self-belief, the camaraderie. I think we both agree that's tangible and real in the NFL that can translate to wins on the football field. Um, I, I guess – my my only worry, you and you kind of brought it up. It is the defense to a degree. You know, in the past defense, we've seen some issues there. You're right. You know, last week they didn't have to worry about the run. But I guess more of my concerns, coach, is just like even last week, and this jumped out to me about the Eagles game a little, where you know they they didn't do anything. They were a little bland and simple, I guess, on defense until they have to be. And I guess that worries me a little bit where last week it wasn't until they were down 27 to 10 where they were like, all right, fine. We can't just play, you know, shell coverage and play conservative. And now we got to do some things. And I guess I worry about that side of the ball to a degree. And if you could see this uh, little graphic we got here, they definitely blitzed more in the second half, forced the issue, gave some different looks. But that is one concern for me. Is, Is there a major concern for you with Minnesota? No, uh, they are creative in the pass rush. They move Zedaria Smith around, they move Hunter around, they try to create matchups. They play basic in the back, but they have a confidence that, hey, in the crucial situation, we're going to get the takeaways. We're going to take care of the football. 
So maybe Taylor Heineke airmails one and it shouldn't happen, but it does happen. And that's what they count on. They're, I'm going to get that strip from behind and knock the ball out. Um, so if I'm coaching against them, I'm saying, hey, if we just go in and play solid football, don't self-destruct and don't go crazy. We can move the ball on this team and we'll be fine. Right. But they count on the other side of it. Hey, we're going to just keep hammering for four quarters. We are going to make something happen. You're going to make that mistake in the fourth quarter and, and we're going to win it. So now these games come down to, you know, even or close five minutes to go and Josh Allen throws a ball that you and I say, why would he throw that ball? Right. But it just seems like that's what people are doing against them. It, it, it really does. It's it's amazing. And that's where I, it's hard for me to put it on. Like, I don't know if they're a little lucky or really good, or maybe it's just a little bit of both combined. I, and then that's, it's, it's one of the more confusing eight and one teams I can remember, co- you know, covering. I've given them the credit, but I'm also like, I've, I've, it's one of the least dominant eight and one teams I guess I've ever seen to, to not be too disrespectful and they've got a stretch coming up where we'll see now they've got three or four games here against some contenders we'll we'll see what they're made of all right all right so let's go to the other team on that matchup there in buffalo because you and i i think we both agree i mean hey there's the defense is creative we think they're better on that side of the ball this year defensive line has more depth more size even though i'm gonna say i'm a little concerned as of late people are running the ball on them last week the jets the packers that was a little scary and the offense we know how awesome josh allen is you and i sit there every week and go oh wow whoa ho, how do you do that how do you do that but he's done some dumb stuff uh i worry about too much being thrown on his shoulders it's just too much josh allen got to do everything and I understand it's not going to change a lot, but that is my worry about them going forward, Coach. How do you kind of view the Bills? I love a lot of things about the Bills, and I think they have all the elements to be a Super Bowl team. Right. I think they're going to have to say there are times when we're going to have to run the ball. And whether it's Josh Allen is going to be our runner or Singletary, but we're going to have to run it. And then there are times where we have to understand we don't have to get 50 points. Right. When we're up, 13 and we're at the five yard line we can kick a field goal yeah you know and rely on our defense so uh everything isn't hey let's put the hammer down and play like we're underdogs uh we're we're a good team make people beat us i i i hear you it's so aggressive and loose at times and that's where it's just seemed josh allen's lost the 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 fine line of wait wait that's crazy and this was tactically you know aggressive Right. Yes. And I think that's what we're seeing, let alone some mismanagement of, of some some coaching situations that I would agree with you, too, where just, you know, let's go up 13 points and make them score two touchdowns. Yeah. Um, uh, so let me ask you this, coach. You know, uh, you bring up the running of the football. Do you think they can like my, my two cents? And I just want to hear you off of this a little bit. You know, I, I'd like them to run the ball too, but but I'm also like I don't know. Can they really, you know, infuse the run game into their game plan and the way they are at this point of the year? I've been kind of saying the thing of like I wish they would just find more ways, almost like Kansas City, to just give Josh Allen some plays off. Here's a speed sweep. Here's a reverse. Here's a screen. Here's another screen. You know, here's a little RPO, so where he doesn't always have to be like I got to make the right read and the right check, and and then oh if it's not there I got to get out of the pocket and then still make a great read and a great throw. I, I feel like that that's where they put too much on him. And I don't know, Coach. Do you think you can make that transition to running the ball more? Or do you think maybe they should take the approach of, hey, let's add more screen speed sweeps and stuff like that to make it a little easier? Yeah, and however, I'm I'm okay with that, just what you're describing. Okay. But to me, you've got to do something where it's not just – because everybody is playing for the downfield throw. That's and I, right. I, I know how Ken Dorsey and Sean McDermott are sitting there thinking, I've got Josh Allen, I've got Stephon Diggs, I've got all these weapons. For me, just to run the ball and make four yards, why would I do that when I can make 15 with a throw? And Andy Reid goes through that. I've got Patrick Mahomes. I've got all these weapons. Why would I want to run the ball for five yards? Well, uh, sometimes that's okay. And sometimes you got to make yourself do it. And uh, that's where I think Buffalo is right now. So whether it's, uh, you know, how we run Isaiah McKenzie on a, on a, speed sweep like you're saying right. or singletary on the screen there there's ways i could get these guys the ball safe plays that we can 
make the defense not just sit back there in that deep shell and say, I'm going to take away the 15 yard play. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, you know, are you, would you be, if you're them, would you think about the OBJ conversation and adding another weapon? I've got to been one coach that goes like, I like Gabe Davis, but I don't think he's like, you know, a superstar game plan changer type of guy. I almost look at him as a low level two or an awesome number three. Uh, and I don't mean to be disrespectful in that way, but if you were them, would you flirt with the OBJ idea? I, I think always getting adding a weapon can help you. If, if you can get a, a free weapon, nothing wrong with it. But I don't think they need OBJ to win. I just think they need to direct their attack a little differently. They played well enough in the first half of these games. Yeah. If you just – took the first half of every game, you'd say this is the best team in football. Uh-huh. You're, you're exactly right. I, I, I wrote, you know, Pete Demolitis, I'll tell you, I wrote three or four pages on the notes last week, and I just go, if you didn't see the scoring plays, you would think the Bills are up by 25 points, you know, in the football game. You really would with the way they controlled the football game. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still one of those crazy guys, coaches, that even though the Bills lost, I go, I don't know. I still think the Bills are better than the Vikings. And, and I don't mean that to be to be mean or anything. It's just it's just what I think. But, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say that with a, a fresh loss like that. All well, right. you don't uh, – yeah. if you have to make a fourth and 18 one-handed catch uh, every every week to win, you're, you're not going to win all the time. Yeah, okay, exactly. That's what I've been trying to tell people. Or You can't depend on you know Josh Allen to just throw dumb interceptions or that quarterback to do that all the time. But somehow, some way, it keeps happening. All right? And then uh, let's move on to a new team, if you don't mind, Coach, unless there's something else you wanted to hit on there no. with Buffalo. All right, cool. Let's go to another AFC East team that I think we're both amazed by in a lot of ways. And and that's the Dolphins. Mike McDaniel, what he's brought there to that team, the offense, such a creative scheme. It really fits Tua. They've made it, you know, about him and accentuating his strengths and limiting the weaknesses and all of that. Uh, I love the offense. I know we both love the weapons and the offense. Um, what else? Is there anything else I'm missing that you love? And what's your biggest concern with the Dolphins as we go down the last, you know, seven, eight games here? I love what Mike McDaniel has done with Tua. And it reminds me of what the Ravens did with Lamar Jackson. They mm. said, we've got a unique talent. We're going to build around what he does. And we're going to put an offense that highlights him. And so Tua is doing exactly what he does well. They've got these fast receivers who put a lot of pressure on you. They can run the ball. Everything ties in together. I'm concerned about their defense. Mm. Uh, I, I just – Again, when if they get into a situation where we haven't just shocked people on offense and people are behind and they have to throw, how are we going to hold up? And I'm also concerned if we have to go to the Jets, if we have to go to Baltimore, if we have to go to Kansas City or Tennessee, we get in that cold weather and maybe that RPO game isn't just quite clicking. Right? Are we really going to be able to lock down and stop people and win a 21-17 game if uh -huh. we have to? I, I I hear you, Coach. I think that's pretty spot on. That's the thing I worry about. It, it is the – it's New England up in New England in a few weeks yeah. or Buffalo up in Buffalo where, okay, wait, we got a yeah. chance to see you already once or twice or once and we got a little feel for how you attack and we take away some of the tricks and things that McDaniel brings to the, the field and now, okay, can you – can you actually just run the ball on us when you, we know you're going to run the ball? Yeah. Or can you pick up a third and eight and really, you know, throw it out route in the cold weather and the wind? I, I, I worry about that too. And then defensively, what is it, Coach? Is just like, is it just the the big plays? They're, they 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 blitz and they're over aggressive to me. That's the thing that kind of jumps out. And I thought maybe the Bradley Chubb trade would, you know, change them a little bit more to your style. Hey, let's rush four. Let's play some zones and be a little bit like take away the big play. But I don't think that's changed them a whole lot as far as what I've seen so far. And maybe it will as they get used to him and they see what he can do. And, right. and or maybe I call a four-man rush and he gets a sack. And, wow, that, isn't that great? I, you know, this guy can beat someone one-on-one. -on -one. I don't have to create for him. So maybe that will come. But I, I just think that they're a team that is living and dying by pressure and they're, they're creating confusion. You're going to get in the playoffs and you're going to play people that you aren't going to be able to confuse. And uh, that's when we'll, we'll see. Uh, I think you have to be at times just be able to play sound football and line up and stop the run with 
front seven, cover and rush. Um, and, and there's times you aren't going to just overwhelm people with this volume of stuff you bring. That, uh, that's right. I just and the, I, I don't know how they do it. I, I, I feel for those DBs sometimes. Xavier Howard, I th- still think he's amazing. And I just go, man, they put him on an island in some situations where I just go. So much. Yeah, right. I just go, I don't know. I don't know if anybody in the world, in the history of the world, could cover some of these receivers in the position <laughs> he's put in. And, you know, <laughs> I'm including the great Deion Sanders in that. It's just, it's unbelievable. Hey, cover the guy that's runs 4 2 in the inside slot formation all over the field is just an impossible ask and I do like to your point when they play the better teams who figure out how to pick up the blitz and all that they're going to get exposed that way that's at least my concern as we go forward and we'll we'll see where that where it goes from there um I want to hit on the a team from the uh from our game this week on Sunday night football we got Chiefs Chargers Sunday night football Chiefs gave them a little run for their money the first time they played but the Chiefs specifically is what I want to hit on here coach uh Definitely one of the best teams in football. I know we're both in agreement there. We both respect Andy Reid, Spagnuolo, everything they do. Mahomes is playing phenomenal. Um, You talked about it a little bit ago, you know, as far as not falling in the trap of throwing the ball 20 yards down the field all the time. First thing is, Coach, am I crazy to think that there's like a – there's a slash of toughness in the Chiefs offense this year. The, the first little change I see that really got me excited when they made the move and said, we're going to put Isaiah Pacheco in as our starting running back. Uh-huh. Why did they do that? Because they saw this guy running hard and tough. And this guy can make six yard gains. Right. And um, it just triggered a little, maybe there's a different thought process here. We aren't going to play the guy who can catch the ball out of the backfield and run all these different routes and, and, can do this we're playing this tough guy who can run inside and slash and they've got a different mindset now right and people are going to sit back and say okay we're going to cover all these deep zones we're going to play two deep safeties we don't think you'll run the ball he he gives them that that mindset so that's a little bit different and uh they they have been more patient uh as an offense in the last four or five weeks than i've seen the chiefs in a long time right I, it, it's amazing. I, I know you and I are behind the scenes. We've talked about Mahomes and how patient, and he's playing phenomenal football, and obviously in the 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 uh, MVP conversation. But you know, I, I, I echo your sentiments there. I mean, patience in the play calling. There is more of like the screens and the speed sweeps. I feel yeah. like it's not always you know, hey, let's try to throw it fifty yards down the middle of the field. But that's, to me, Coach, I'm with you. The Pacheco, when I watched that on film the other day, I just was like, I, I, I had moments of going, man, the, the Chiefs got road graders. They look like they're a tough running physical team here. He's one of those guys, I think, to your point, Coach, where he gets hit for a three-yard game, but he drives the pile for another three or four yards. And you go, oh, it's second and four, second and five. Uh, I, I, it's going to be interesting to see if they stay with this, but I'm I'm hopeful, and it does give them a, a different element for sure. But it, yeah, it will ahead. be interesting Sunday night because we we know the Chargers run defense, and we know how suspect it is. The Chargers are going to do a lot of stuff to take away that passing game, and they're going to play deep. And so, can Kansas City just stay with it and be patient and run the ball? Um, uh, last year or beginning this year, I would have said no, they can't, and and maybe it's different, and maybe they will. I know uh, Sunday night. It, it is amazing, but between last week, the Bucks game we had on Sunday Night Football, a few weeks with the Chiefs, uh, yeah. that game, I just sit there and you know, I just I'm going, wow, I I actually think they want to run the ball a little bit instead of like. Years past, I think, to what you're saying, it felt like they just wanted to run the ball because they were like, let's give Mahomes and the receivers a break for a play or two. Now it seems like they really want to do it. But do, do, what what is your biggest concern with the Chiefs, Coach? I mean, they're playing pretty damn good football. you know. But what's the one thing that you know jumps out to you as a weakness or a kryptonite for them? It, it's still their defense yeah. uh, to me. If, if Again, you know, they if they play a team like Washington did to Philly, where they're just going to come pound it and try to keep the ball away from Mahomes, can they hold on? I don't think the Chargers will play that way, right. but they're going to run into people who play that way. They play the New England Patriots. Um, it would be that kind of game. Tennessee was that kind of game. Yes, there just no wasn't enough pass no game to worry, threat. help yes. it out. Right, right, yes. right. But uh, that that kind of game where you just – 
run the clock, keep making first downs, keep getting it to third and two and run it. Hit me with an occasional play action pass because when when I have to gang up on that run, I'm going to bring run blitzes. I'm going to be out there bumping run. Now you've got a chance to, to get some throws. Uh, I, I still have my concerns about their defense, but I think their offense is playing at such a high level. It, yeah. it makes up for a lot of things. Yeah, I, I, I think we're on the same page there too, Coach. And the, the defense, I, I, I'm with you. I, you know, they seem to be good. If if it's a team that throws the ball a ton, they they can do it. Or if it's a team that, like you said, Tennessee Titans, they can't throw that night. It's Malik Willis and receivers are hurt and they know it's all run. They're pretty good at, you know, Hey, let's strap on the chin straps a little tighter and stop it. It is, it's the balance team. It, you know, it brings me back to the, the Super Bowl against the Buccaneers a few years ago. That's kind yeah. of what they did, right, coach? It was like, wait, yeah. we, we run it so well. We run it well enough that you have to worry about it. And we pass it pretty well, too. Yeah. And now you're in a bad spot there. And I know there's only a handful of teams in football that can really do that. But I, I, I'm, I think I'm with you in that, that a balanced offense is a little scary for that defense. Even go back to earlier Las Vegas game. They right. got down 17 points to Las Vegas. Why? Josh Jacobs will pound it in there, pound it in there. Okay, to stop that, now we're going to go bump and run on Devontae Adams. Now I get a couple of easy throws. Raiders couldn't sustain that, but they had the right formula. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you're exactly right. I forgot about the Raiders game, and that's exactly what they did to him. So we'll see. AFC, oddly enough, I feel like there's not a ton of teams that really – fit that mold as far as being able to do both at a pretty high level. You know, I, it, I, it might be Tennessee. It might when, be when, when ten, yeah, right. When they get Tannehill back and then the one to what the jets can do that. Yes. Right. New England can do it. Yes. You're right. The new England can run the ball really high level and throw it well enough. You're right there where it's going to keep you honest. So it's, it's those, I think you might've just mentioned it right there, coach. That might be the three teams that could be, you know, under the radar scary for them if they had to play them in the playoffs. Um, all right, let's, let's shift gears to the uh, NFC. Cause I know you got to go here in a few minutes and I really appreciate this. This is awesome. I mean, this really is again, this is Chris Sims on button and we got coach coach, Tony Dungy, hanging out today i'm hanging out with hall of famers no big deal here no big deal um but i do want to talk about you, you brought up the cowboys and you know cowboys two things that you know we the defense the playmaking the chaos they can create the offense they're running the ball and i mean they've gotten back to smash mouth dominate the line of scrimmage type of football you know what what's your thought on the cowboys and you know that one thing that you love and that one thing you hate about them well, I, I love how talented they are, and I do think they have the right formula. And everybody's kind of been down on Zeke Elliott, but we've seen the last couple of weeks without him in there, that, that physical toughness, that pounding, I think you still need that. Pollard gives them the home run threat, and you want that. You want to give Pollard the ball, but you still need that toughness that Zeke brings. Right. And then defensively, um, they're going to be a load if you have to throw. You get behind or you're not able to run the ball well and it's just throw, throw, throw. These guys will give you a headache and they'll beat your quarterback up. But if you can take that away, slow the game down, make them have to defend the run, it's a different defense. It, it definitely is. It's, 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 it's a little scary, honestly. You know, not, I don't want to say scary, but it's concerning for sure. Uh, when, when you do look at them, Coach, I, I worry about the, the size of their defensive line altogether. You know, both defense ends. Demarcus Lawrence is 260 pounds. Doris Armstrong's 250. Yeah. You know, they got Odigizua, one of their D tackles, is 280 yeah. pounds, right? You know, so I just look at that and I go, yeah, they're going to have issues there. And then what stinks for them when they get in these running game run game is, you know, Michael Parsons doesn't get a chance to rush the passer, yeah. and now he gets to play yeah. stand up linebacker. And 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 another thing I wanted to ask you, just with. You know, I was shocked that, okay, they got to play run defense and stop, you know, the Green Bay last week. But then to just play, you know, bump man-to-man -man off of it, where, like, can we find another zone to play to where we Happy just – Happy medium. Right, yeah. right, right. So, that, you know, that concerned me a little bit. But go ahead, like, piggyback off that if you don't mind. Well, and, and I think – you mentioned the AFC, how many teams are going to play that way? Well, in the NFC, to come through the NFC, you're going to have to right. play some of those games. Right. Okay, you may play San Francisco. You may play Philadelphia. You may play the Giants uh, where you're going to have to bow up and stop some, some run games. Yeah. You may even play Washington. Right. So, um, you know, you got to get ready for that. And that's what they're going to have to show that they can deal with. Now, we went through that a little bit 
my Super Bowl year. Yes. And we were a, a dominant pass rushing team that had a great offense. But if you could stay even with us and keep running, um, you know, we, you, you, you could do some damage. Bob Sanders came back and, and helped that. I don't know if the Cowboys had that one guy that we can say, oh, he's going to really – Right. Up the run game for us but to me that's how to play the cowboys and and that that's what they've got to get ready for yeah you know it, i i do find it kind of like you know fascinating or cool to the because uh, i've hit this theme a little bit where the afc seems to be about the quarterback play and we're gonna make plays in the passing game and the NFC, you got uh, more of the traditional approach football teams, like you said. Yeah. I mean, Minnesota's balance. You know, Philadelphia's yeah. got the balance. Tampa Bay looks like they're trying to get into balance. Yeah. I mean, right? I mean, it's it's, it's almost funny you mentioned that uh, because I talked to Todd Bowles opening day when we we're getting ready for our first show, and yeah. he said, "We if we're going to compete, we have to be able to run the ball better in the big games." And we have to get our defense back to stopping the run because he was looking at that NFC run through. And hey, we're going to have to deal with San Francisco. We're going to have to deal with Aaron Donald. We're going to have to deal with Minnesota, even Green Bay. We, we said it on the show the other night. If they run, they've got a chance to beat Dallas. And that's what happened. They got Aaron Jones and Dylan going early in the game. And, and it was a different story. All right. So do you think we saw just off of what you said there, the the awakening of the beast the beast of Tampa there. Do you think the Bucks got us got something here? Would you would you expect this to kind of continue and then play well here down the stretch and and string together a few wins? I really do. I, I think they, for the first time, understood we have to get this run game going offensively if we're going to be a, a winner. We've got to be balanced, and that's going to help our passing game. Defensively, I think they always knew they need to stop the run. They just got healthy. They they got some people back. They got their run defenders, Antoine right. Winfield included in that group, back. And they're, they're going to be tough to deal with down the stretch here in December. I, I You're right. I mean, I, I kind of look at it the way, same way. I mean, I, I look at them at 5-5 five and five right now. And just from what we saw last week and even the toughness in the Rams game, and I think you and I both know how capable their defense is, not only with the talent, but how good Todd is as a coach on the on the other on that side too. As far as scheme and players, it's a great match. I, man, I, I you know I'm a little bit like man Tampa, and then Brady. We know he's going to be clutch and do a lot of the right things there. And if they can run the ball, he then will be protected better a little bit. Uh, they're one of those teams right now where I, I you know they might be off the Super Bowl radar, but. Gosh, there's some things about them where I go. We, we need to keep them right on the fringe. Okay, so you do agree, right? Right. All right. I, I think it, I think we're both saying it's going to come down to a little bit of that offensive line, and can they just run the ball enough to? They don't have to be great at it, right, Coach? Just run it enough yeah. to where you got to stay honest defending it. Yeah, uh, Washington was a great example the other night. Yeah. They, they what did they average? Three, Three nine, yards, something yeah, in there. carry, yeah, right, yeah. right. But they ran it enough, and they ran it effectively, and they made Philadelphia defend it. And they wore them down. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's going to be fascinating down the stretch. It really is. I mean, we got some different styles of football teams here, and Coach, I I really appreciate you kind of diving in here with me today. I really do. Oh, it's been fun. Oh, we you you are the again, man. And, yeah. You let and me. did I have that kind of impact on your language? I don't think I heard one curse word today. You, you, <laughs> you're, you're damn right you did, Coach. You are damn right. I couldn't even say the word I wanted to say right there, even there. You definitely did. I didn't get a chance. You know, I just I, – I don't know what it is. I like you too much. I look at you almost like as a, a father figure or something like that, and I just don't want to be disrespectful, even though yeah. you always tell me, like, hey, I, I have been in an NFL locker room i have heard four letter <laughs> words <laughs> well it's always fun being on with you chris don't let me button up the podcast too much keep it unbuttoned all right coach thanks so much man i really appreciate it have a great rest of your week i'll see you sunday all right see you sunday can't wait all right man be good all right that was the great coach tony dungy it was phenomenal i love coach coaches He's got a great view of the football world, you know, the basics of wait, let's this team needs to get back to fundamentals. You know, his management of football games is the one area I just always am in amazement with him on Sundays because he is great at that. I mean, again, this is a guy that gosh, he won a lot of games managing the game. I mean, what is what does everybody think he was doing in Tampa Bay all those years? 
that defense shutting everybody down. Coach Dungy, you know, making sure, hey, well, we're going to run the offense like this. We're not that good, but we're not going to put ourselves in bad situations. We might be ugly, but that's what we got to do to win this game with the way our team's built right there. And uh, that's why Coach Dungy is the absolute man. He really is, and uh, I appreciate him coming on. All right, we're going to keep hitting on a few more teams here just to uh, finish out the podcast. First, thing, we, ne- I, we got to hit on a lot with Coach. The one team I really didn't get to hit on him with that I would have loved to have heard his little assessment on is the Seattle Seahawks. And, you know, with the Seattle Seahawks, I watched that game, of course, uh, on film this past week. Uh, against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And, yes, it was a bad matchup. You know, you heard Coach Dungy just talk about matchups. Is Matchups are, are a key part of the league. You know, you, you, you can be better than a team in totality, but then play a team that's built a different way and put money into different assets where you might be, you know, a little less money and assets into that area, and all, all of a sudden you're in a mismatch. Seahawks, there was two things that I, or a few things that jumped out in the game. One – Coach Dungy talked about Tampa Bay. Their defense, healthy, it, it's, it's a special unit. It, it is a top five worthy conversation type of defense, and I think probably ultimately it'll be there when the season's all said and done. And with, with that matchup specifically, where it hurt Seattle and why they lost is Seattle's old line is good. It's better. Let's not say good. It's better than years past. So that's a positive. But it's still not dominant. You guys have heard me here on the last few weeks with the Seahawks and some of the Ken Walker runs where I've gone, hey, he's had some runs for 20 yards where I go, he should have been tackled for a negative two-yard loss, but he got a big run. Now, I'm not trying to disrespect them. They certainly open up some holes and do some positive things too. But all I'm trying to do is make a point that the offensive line, it's not a juggernaut yet. And then they had to play a juggernaut defensive line, and we saw what happened. A juggernaut defensive line on a, fo- on a field that was horrible – and then Kenneth Walker's speed and quickness was negated to a degree because he had to run like he was Fred Flintstone everywhere he got because the, the turf was made for soccer players who were 5'9", 155 pounds. And it's not used to, oh, Akeem Hicks who runs 4'8", at 340 pounds is on here. So that was an issue in that game. But my point more with the X's and O's there is the defensive line of the Bucks and the defense of the Bucks. they didn't have to go all in on stopping the run and Kenneth Walker. And that allowed them, again, to stop Tyler Lockett, stop DK Metcalf down the field, not only with the scheme, but they got the, the Jimmies and the Joes on the outsides to, to stop that as well. So that was that was encouraging there as far as for the Bucks and one of the issues of the matchup for the Seahawks. And then, it, you know, honestly, on the other side of the ball, when you break that game down, it's kind of the same thing. It's a little bit, you know, they have some size here, um, but they're a, the, the Seattle defense has some size up front. But where I would say that an issue for them is they don't have anybody really super talented. Ochana Nuwosu is really the only guy that's capable of individually creating plays on his own. Excuse me as I'm burping with his own physical talent. He's maybe the one guy, and, and, and even saying that, he's not the he's not a superstar. He's not a guy we're sitting here going every week where teams are going, you better double him and you know put a tackle and a tight end on him to block him. It's not to that capacity. He's just the only guy that kind of pops out in that manner at times. So that played into the hands of the Bucks too in the matchup specifically because the Bucks we know they're not great up front but they're 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 solid in getting better and with what I'm talking about here is so Seattle because of their lack of playmakers and you know big time guys who can get off a block and create havoc because you go through the game and you really go I don't know I'm in the third quarter here I don't think I've talked about Anybody in the front seven of the Seattle Seahawks other than maybe Jordan Brooks, who's done something at an elite level and extraordinary. So that's where you so what has Seattle done to help that aspect of their defense out? They've gotten they're a little into creativity at the line of scrimmage. This guy blitzes, this guy drops out. Hey, we're gonna slant this way, we're gonna slant that way, we're gonna stunt this way, stunt that way. They kind of tried to create chaos to help them for that lack of playmaker stopping the run. And rushing the passer because they don't—they can't rush the passer unless they blitz up there in Seattle or confuse you. Well, 
what are you not going to do to Tampa Bay and them? I mean, they're not going to really confuse Brady on a consistent basis. So they knew that, let alone they knew Brady and Leftwich, even with some of these crazy looks at the line of scrimmage, kind of like Green Bay and Dallas, where they knew, wait, they're going to be able to block us. They're, they're well enough coached and smart enough group here that where we get in some of these crazy defensive alignments, pass or run, they're going to block us the right way, and it can end up being a huge run or a huge pass down the field because they pick up the blitz and now they got the right scheme and we got guys one-on-one with Mike Evans and so on and so on. So what they did because of the matchup, they simplified Seattle. Seattle basically played very simple defenses for the majority of the day, played a lot of two safety, two deep safety defenses, and that helped the Bucks to run the football. And once they started running the football, okay, Seattle had to finally start to come down and help out the run game. And that's when Brady in the play action pass just started to absolutely gash the Seattle Seahawks in, in all ways. So that was an impressive win. Seattle, that's something to watch for. Certainly. And I think that's why, you know, with Seattle, and I'm going to pull up their schedule here, I think that's a little bit of a, a trend that you can look at with them. You know, teams at San Francisco beat them, right? San Francisco dominated them. I think that's a little bit of the, the problem there is, you know, an offense and defensive line that, oh, no, that puts us in a bind. We can't really play the way we want to play. And now we have to adjust and do do it a different way. And, you know, they struggle in that department. So that's something to watch for for the Seattle Seahawks. But I was I don't know why my computer crapped out here and it won't pull up the Seattle Seahawks schedule. Um, all right. Let's. Uh, so they got so Pete's in my ear. They got to buy this week. Vegas Rams. Yeah, Panthers. 49ers at the Chiefs, Jets. Okay, so, hey, we'll see. The Rams, the 49ers, the Chiefs, the Jets, you know, those are some teams that could maybe cause some of those those problems that we're talking about here. So let's see where that goes with, with the Seattle Seahawks. And, uh, again, that's a team that I still think is dangerous. I think if you made me bet right now, I would take – the San Francisco 49ers to still win that division when all said and done. And again, I know I'm a little more bullish on the San Francisco 49ers than most teams, but uh, that's just the way I feel. And, you know, as we look here and, and um, you know, what do you want to do here, Pete? Yeah, you want to talk Bucks a little bit? All right. Uh, we kind of hit on the Bucks with Coach Coach Dungy, but, but either way, you know, I think just to uh, specifically hit on them, I'd like to see another week of the run game to say before I say it's fixed, right? And I just, you heard me explain a little bit about the Seattle issues with this matchup, right? So I don't know. I want to see, wait, what's a team that they're going to play here sometime soon who who has some more elite run-stopping defenders or D linemen to where now, again, they're not like Seattle to where they got to help that group out. So that's that'll be the test. And they're not going to get it. You know, after the bye against the Cleveland Browns, they'll be able to run on them. I mean, we can get high school teams that can run on them to a degree. You know, the Saints game, though, the next week, that would be a, a little bit of a ooh, gauge the temperature. And then the week after that is the San Francisco 49ers. I think that's when we'll get a feel. If Tampa can get somewhat close to what you heard Coach Dungy talk about or what you've heard me say early in the year and what I've talked about when the year they won the Super Bowl, to me – they're at their best, and Brady will be at his best if you can run and play balanced football. I know last year, 2021 season was fun with Brady throwing for 5,000 yards and all of that, but I don't necessarily think it was the best thing for them overall to win the Super Bowl. And I think with this, you know, and as we saw, you know, we saw in the Rams game, what happened? Throw the ball every play. He was under pressure. He was ducking. He was jittery. You know, they should have lost by 40 points. And the Rams dropped the ball running the end zone. Cooper Cup drops the ball on a flat route, you know, in the flat. And just a normal tackle, you know. So they were a little lucky to get back in the football game. And I know Brady was clutch too. But point being that when they can run it just well enough and, and just well enough to where we're talking like if you get three yards per rush, that's just well enough to now, wait, we can't let them be – 
and second and six or second and seven or third and four every time. So now the defense starts to play some run-stopping defenses, and then that's where Brady and the play-action pass, and then off that play-action, it's very easy to protect the quarterback that way. And that's where I think he can be at his best, and that's where they can be dangerous. And then with that defense, that's where, you know, if you remember me saying a few weeks ago when I was on here with the big f***er, Big Phil Sims, I was just going – they're, they're, they're the team, as compared to Green Bay, that I had a little more confidence in as far as turning around because there's just some elements of eliteness on their football team that are that are still very real. Um, all right, anything else I didn't hit on my film-wise, uh, film wise, Pete? You think we hit it all? All right, so it's time for some bet MGM, AFC, NFC odds, all right? I mean, the things are getting interesting. It's 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 hard, you know. You know, put your money where your mouth is if you know where you you think or you you think you know where things are going here. But look at this: the odds provided by our Bet MGM team. I mean, conference champions, best bet to make the Super Bowl. I mean, first off, I'm I'm am more amazed by what I'm seeing on the NFC graphic. Again, I don't look at these graphics before we we do these segments, so I can react live. That's what I want to do. But look, the 49ers, the 49ers have become the second biggest favorite in the NFC at five and four to get to the Super Bowl. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. And right now, as it stands, they're the seventh seed. Now, I expect them to go on a run and they're getting close to being healthy here. So, uh, uh, and again, anybody that's been listening to this podcast, you know, they, they, they wouldn't be shocked. To, to know that the 49ers are good. But it's, it's interesting to see the public has turned there a little bit. And then the fact that the Vikings are more of a favorite than the Cowboys, I'm a little surprised by that too. Again, I'm one that still needs to see a little bit more about the Vikings. It's good. Don't get me wrong. You know, there's some clutch and some camaraderie. Uh, there's also a shamrock up their ass. So that's where I just not totally sold yet. I would put the Cowboys in front of the Vikings. AFC, not a whole lot of shock there. And honestly, I think that in the AFC, as far as the odds and everything that you talk about there, the Bills are at the top of the list, the plus 200, Chiefs plus 230, Ravens in third with plus 650, Dolphins at plus 900, followed by the Bengals and the Titans. At, at, I um, I think I would still take the Bills over the Chiefs. Pete asked me in my ear, but you take the Bills over the Chiefs? I, I think I would. And, and again, it's a head-to-head matchup world. And, and, and I'm not like totally wor- – I'm not worried about the Bills. The Bills is like very correctable stuff. That's where – it's not like I'm going – the running defense is worrying me a little. I'm not going to lie there. But, man, you know, I didn't get the chance. To, the dumb shit they did last weekend in that Minnesota game, their young players really let them down. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I probably would still give the edge to the, the Bills. But it's barely over the Chiefs who were – in my opinion, barely over the Ravens. And then you got the Dolphins, who are dangerous, certainly with that offense. Defense, as you heard Coach Dungy talk about, a little concerning there. Bengals, we got to see a little bit of a run game and that offensive line play a little bit better before I buy into them. We did see a semblance of that in their last game against the Carolina Panthers before the bye week. The Titans, a team, are the team that I think are people are disrespecting a little bit. The Titans are the team in the AFC that has a formula of football style and play that I think could be annoying to teams like the Bills and the Chiefs. And that's that'll be interesting. It's not going to be sexy with the Titans. They're at plus 1600, but they're made for playoff football with you know, arguably the best defensive line in football in that conversation and then the most creative secondary movement play coverages in football. And then we know that running game, and that's where I, you know, I look at them to be. Let's don't don't sleep on the Tennessee Titans. Again, it's it's the AFC quarterback conference versus the NFC. We got a full team. We play balanced football conference really right now, and I think that's kind of fascinating that it's it's kind of lining up that way. All right, I I got the BetMGM app. It's awesome. I'll be on it tonight as I start to figure out games I'm going to pick, best bets, all of that. All right? The action never stops at BetMGM. Sign up now using bonus code SIMS, and your first wager is risk-free up to $1,000. So say you bet $100 in the Buccaneers to win the Super Bowl. If you win, you will get $700. But if you lose, you still get $100 worth of free bets. 
BetMGM covering your butt there. I like that one for sure. Simply download the BetMGM app today or go to BetMGM.com and enter bonus code SIMS to make your first wager risk-free up to $1,000. All right, BetMGM, you the man, you the company. All right, and like I said, I'll be on that app. The app is really awesome, actually, uh, and it's very easy even for a guy like me who's technologically stupid. All right, as usual here lately, Ahmed's ditched me once again. What an asshole. A few weeks ago, he ditched me to hang out with some fucking horses. This week, he ditched me to hang out with white sand beaches and crystal clear water. What the fuck? What the and his wife, damn, and his family. Okay, fine. We'll give him a pass on that. Guy deserves a break every now and then. He is on a vacation and I hope he's enjoying himself. I'm just playing with Ahmed. But we don't we don't forget about Ahmed even when he forgets about us. And we got Ahmed's big butt awards. We gotta talk about that a little bit. All right. And we've got two two guys that are definitely worthy of this conversation. The first guy, this is why I love Ahmed. I mean, sometimes he goes with the star guy that you just you gotta pick. But he he's good at going with the under the radar, doesn't get enough credit type of guy, too. His first big butt award winner, Danico Autry of the Tennessee Titans. First off, this dude is one of the most underrated defense alignment in football. All right. And I mean, he had just an unbelievable week. He was all over Russell Wilson all game. Listen to this: 10 pressures, eight hurries, most by any edge defender this week. 41 pressures this year, tied for fifth this season by any edge defender in the NFL, right? So, man, that's a lot of disruption. That's a lot of f***ing the play up. That really is, let alone, and we're not even talking about run stuff. And Danico Autry, I mean, you know, I know I said it a few weeks ago, what a career, just been on a bunch of teams, never been bad, always been good on all these teams, you know, Kind of a tweener, defensive tackle, defensive end, and Tennessee using them the right way. I mean, they really are. He's playing defense ends and some passing situations, plays deep tackle. They're a load up front in Tennessee. You better watch out for that group right there. They can dominate games almost single-handedly. That's why between that and their run game, if they just have some semblance of a pass game, they're going to be tough to deal with. But good for Danico Autry. And that domination last week was without Jeffrey Simmons in the lineup. I mean, just to think, what, what would a Denver's offense look like if the best defensive tackle in football was playing? All right. And, yep, and Bud Dupree was out last week. Good job, Pete. Pete reminded me there. All right, let's get to one of me and Pete's favorite big butts in all of football, Ahmed's Big Butt Awards. And, I mean, let me just tell you, this is, this is not only a Big Butt Award winner, but this is truly one of the bigger butts in all of football, and that's Dexter. Sexy Dexy. Dexter Lawrence of the New York Giants. First time ever. We've got a two-time winner of the Big Butt Awards. I mean, but it was undeniable. I mean, I don't know. Me and Peter watching the game last week just going, man, Dexter Lawrence, Dexter Lawrence, Dexter Lawrence. Uh, he was phenomenal. He really is. And, you know, again, big run-stopping, run-stuffing defense alignment. Uh, no, not so fast. Not so fast. I mean, this guy is a dancing polar bear. I mean, that's, that's what he is. He's got incredible feet. I mean, he really has incredible feet and an incredible bil- ability to push the pocket in the pass game and even, like, get on the edge of a guard and, you know, kind of turn the corner a little bit on him. For a guy that's 350 pounds, it's extremely impressive how athletic and nimble he is on his feet. He got nine pressures, tied for the most for any defensive tackle this week in the NFL. He got two and a half sacks and a career high – of five quarterback hits. So that was a hell of a performance by Dexter Lawrence. Big butt award winner. We got Danico Autry on one cheek and De- Sexy Dexy on the other cheek. Damn, that's a good combination right there. I don't think that elephant's ass is big enough for these two guys. These guys are monsters right there. I mean, Dexter Lawrence's ass might be the same size of an elephant's ass. I'm saying that play- playfully, okay? We do. We love Sexy Dexy here, and we love the G-Men. All right, now it's time for the Peter Peter Awards. Peter, 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 Peter. It's Pete Demolitis's Peter Peter Punt Awards. I've never seen a guy who gets so excited on Sunday about a ball being downed at the two-yard line. Holy shit, calm down, weirdo, weirdo. Um, all right. <laughs> 
Here we go. Here we go. 116 punts this week, and Pete, wa Pete watched every one of them. Punter of the week, Seahawks punter Michael Dixon. Eh, he's a hell of a punter, Pete. There's, there's no doubt. Five punts, four inside the 20. None of them were returned. Average net of 50 yards. Uh, that's that's pretty big time. I didn't even realize he had that kind of a week, Pete. Good job by you. And uh, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I yeah, you, you think about it, it the Bucks were kind of down in their territory, starting at just about every drive of the football game, and and uh, that's a big weapon. And we know Seattle, Pete Carroll, he will play that field position game. He is not one to go for it on fourth and one at the 45 yard line going in or any of that. And in fact, I think he had a decision like that in the game the other day where he had about a fourth and one around that area and he punted it and, and pinned Tom Brady uh, deep back in his, his own end uh, early in the football game. Flyer of the week. Man, this is a repeat winner, Pete. Percy Butler, one of Chris Sims' top five safeties in the draft. He won back in week seven. Fourth round rookie out of Louisiana Lafayette. Clutch play of the week, 336 left in the game. Split a double team. Very hard to do, Pete said in parentheses, and made a diving tackle at the Philly 20-yard line. Kept the Eagles backed up on what would be their last real drive. That was a big play, Pete. You're right. Because there's a little room there. That guy might have you know, sprung, got them out there in a favorable position to where, um, yeah, the drive wouldn't have been as hard. And, of course, that was a – Let's see, that that drive, how did that drive end, Pete, there in that football game there? Do you remember how that ended? Yeah, I can't remember either. I got to remember my, myself. Uh, they might have ended up going for it on fourth down and then just not got it. Is that how that went? Uh, that was a – yep. All right, so that was the three three and out. Yeah, that's right. Yep. All right, so so that was big. That was the, the tackle – and then the Miles Sanders up the middle for two yards, incomplete Jalen Hurts, and then Jalen Hurts was sacked on third down, and that was a uh, great job by Percy Butler. So there's the Peter Peter Awards. Um, Peter will send a trophy to them, and we don't know what that trophy is going to be. A lot of speculation, a lot of rumors there, a lot of rumors. Um, all right, everybody. Pete, anything else we missing? Wow. Wow, the Eagles just signed Linvel Joseph, and you know, thirty, yep, thirty-four years old, big guy, can two gap. I mean, he's been around the NFL. He, he can, he can still have some value to their football team. You know, one of the things I will say with the Eagles, and I didn't get to bring this up, I'm not as worried about their run stopping ability, especially when Jordan Davis gets back. He's going to be healthy. That's going to add him another body. You know, Linvel Joseph will obviously help out. I, I honestly am more worried about the pass rush. And, again, it might not be a problem against the middle class or the weaker teams of football. But, you know, I, I'd worried about it, you know, with some of the elite, or t elite teams, a leader, elite teams in the NFC. And certainly what I would worry about is, like, the AFC and the Super Bowl. If you're the Eagles, I mean, everybody's putting them in the Super Bowl right now. The way they look right now, they're, not, they're never going to get to Patrick Mahomes. He's going to drop back and have all day. All right, so that, that, that worries me. They're, they're, they're not going to get there against Lamar Jackson either. They're not going to get there. They might get there a little bit better against Josh Allen and company because their offensive line maybe not quite as good in that department. But still, I think that's something to worry about with this uh, with this Philadelphia Eagles defense. It's more the pass rush. Than they, that's why they traded for Robert Quinn, who hasn't done anything for them yet. And I hasn't really, I don't think feel like has played a whole lot. But I think that was their thought is, hey, we need to be able to get here with four a little bit when we play some of these – you know, really good offenses in football. So we'll see where it goes. But them signing Limbell Joseph, nice little move, gives them some depth, gives them some size in the middle, help them out until Jordan Davis gets back. All right, everybody, I appreciate you listening. Tomorrow I got the PFT PM, Chris Sims on Button, joint collaboration picks podcast with that asshole Mike Florio. We always have fun there. Again, you know, I mean, uh, my my picks, I think, against the spread weren't bad last week. My best bets were one and two. I, honestly, I'm going to defend myself. My thoughts were not far off. I mean, my thoughts were not. I mean, I lost two of my best bets by a half a point. You know, and, and even with a lot of the other games, I know my thoughts and some of the th stuff I said real. The f***ing game's crazy. I can't always call when a guy's going to drop a punt or somebody's going to throw a stupid f***ing interception or somebody's going to go for it on fourth and three on their own 37-yard line. Yeah, the game changes when, you, you know, that stuff happens. That's a good excuse by me, and I'll continue to use it. Um, check us out on social. 
We're going to do some breaking down of some plays that jumped out to us this past week in the NFL in Week 10. But everybody tune in tomorrow. Me and Florio, Picks Podcast. Keep sending in the questions. I'm going to be back Monday. We'll be back to a normal flow on the podcast. Big thanks to Tony Dungy. He's the man. Everybody have a great weekend. Be safe. Thursday night football, Packers, Titans. That should be pretty damn good. Enjoy that one. Peace out. Talk to you next week. Clap it up. Thanks for watching, homies. Hit subscribe to see all my unbuttoned videos. You get to see me, Ahmed Farid, all the big player breakdowns, game breakdowns, player interviews, and my film analysis. So please subscribe. Chris Sims, Unbuttoned. Peace out.